What's going on, everyone? I'm just a typical, average American here today to react and learn about British Special Forces training. And what I want to take a look at here today is a video teaching about what it takes to become part of the Special Air Service, which is actually a part of the British military that I've never heard of before. So I pulled up the Wikipedia real quick just to get some context here. The Special Air Service is a special forces unit of the British Army founded in 1941. This unit specializes in counterterrorism, hostage rescue, direct action, and covert reconnaissance. Oh my god. So these, this is like the, the toughest of the tough, like some of the baddest of the bad, like people you don't want to mess with part of the British military, which sounds really cool. The training involved in how they select these individuals and how they're trained and if they pass and eventually become part of this special force much, must be pretty intense, to say the least. So I'm, I'm pretty excited and curious to see what this is all like and kind of how it compares to, you know, the American military, our American special forces and stuff. So with that being said, let's take a look. The Special Air Service, Britain's original special forces, and the granddaddy of all modern special forces. Oh. The SAS is the benchmark by which every other special forces unit is measured, and their tactics and really? training methods have been replicated all over the world. The I, I did not know about that. So the SAS uh, is like the oldest special forces unit in the world, and basically set the groundwork for what every other special forces like with every other nation and country on the planet kind of based special force off of. I had no idea that Britain was like the first to even have something like this. That's very interesting. History of the SAS begins in the deserts of World War II, and their feats of daring are the stuff of legend and continue to this day in the global war on terrorism. Wow. One of the toughest special forces outfits in the world to enter into. The SAS requires the absolute best out of every recruit. Many oh my gosh, like, I, this is this getting me hyped up. Like, exactly, the kind of people that go into this line of work, this kind of service, like, massive respect. This is, you have to be maybe a little bit crazy, but in the best way possible to like ha do this, fight for your country. And honestly, this is also not just military service, but the best of the best. You almost have to be like a genius and a super athlete and all this other crazy stuff to even have a crack at this kind of special force. Like, <laughs> I'm excited for this. <laughs> Many apply each year to join this legendary service, and many fail and are washed out of training. What about yeah. you, though? Think you've got what it takes to join the elite SAS? No. SAS selection no. takes place across several phases of selection, with selection phase one, known as endurance, taking place over three grueling weeks. Oh my god, so there's several phases of even being selected for the SAS. Phase one, endurance. Oh my god, if, if you are like... All right, come on, time for phase one. And it, as soon as I heard it was called endurance and took three weeks of training, I'd be like, no, I'm sorry. Not that I would even sign up to begin with. <laughs> Any dummy can be physically fit and carry a heavy pack, but selection phase one will weed out the dumb brutes and leave behind only the mentally and physically strong. Right. For phase one, you'll head out to the countryside in South Wales, but don't expect a picnic, because you'll immediately be put to marching across varying routes. Initially, you'll carry a pack loaded up with the essential gear, such as a rain poncho, sleeping bag, first aid kit, okay. and distress flares. Okay. Though you can expect that as the distance you're forced to march increases, so does the weight. You'll carry your food with you too, which consists of some bread rolls, a few Mars candy bars, and potato chips. So, so do they actually literally increase the weight of your pack? as you're hiking across these different terrains over the course of three weeks, literally carrying everything you need to survive. And I assume you have to do, it's all a camping experience on top of it, living like by your own means and outdoors. It's, yeah, this is, I mean, <laughs> this is extreme, but it's to prepare you to be in the most extreme of situations, right? 
along with a 24-hour ration pack that can only be opened in an emergency. Forced to march endlessly, low on food and sleep, this phase isn't just testing your physical fitness, but your mental fitness as well. Ah. Unlike in most other Special Forces candidate programs, here you won't have to deal with instructors screaming at you and breathing down your neck. Okay. Instead, SAS instructors purposefully leave you completely to your own devices, offering no encouragement, but no chastisement either. You Interesting. Oh, this is very interesting approach. Yeah, because the stereotypical, especially here in America, the stereotypical drill sergeant screaming in your face to, uh, what you need to be doing, it's, a, it's, it's scary and it can be intimidating, but at least it's someone there telling you what to do, telling you how to survive and, you know, theoretically motivating you, even if it is by screaming in your face. That's how, it's us that's how you usually see it depicted here in America with our military. But this, this idea of being left on your own is both nice, because no one's screaming at you, but you're also left on your own. So it really, like, weeds out who can survive by their own means and who, ha who has the knowledge and capability. So this, man, this British Special Forces already in this first phase is trying to weed out and select for the, like, top, top, top percent of individuals. You will pass or fail completely of your own volition. And you better be good at disciplining temptation too, because while you may be starving, opening up that 24-hour emergency ration pack without permission mm. is grounds for rejection. Oh. Attention to detail is critical for an SAS soldier. Oh my gosh, and they, they like give you this extra food, extra food ration pack for emergencies that you have to control yourself. You're starving and you're not even allowed to touch it but you have to carry it around. You're not allowed to eat it. That's like, this is testing you physically and maybe even more so mentally here. So as long as you're trying to drag yourself through another day-long march on your blistered feet, you should expect instructors to occasionally quiz you about landmarks you may have just passed. The purpose is to oh. test your alertness and see how well you can pay attention while physically miserable. One can- Oh my gosh, this is not just a, like a survival training. This is constantly testing if you're aware of your surroundings and where you are and if you can manage your food and manage your equipment. And this is so much more. This is intense. And again, only phase one, right? Endurance. Candidate said he was asked how many supports were on a bridge he had just crossed over during his march. Eventually, you'll face the final test, a grueling 40-mile march up and down hills, carrying 55 pounds of gear and an assault rifle to boot. Not Literally, you have to be 40-mile hike. 40 miles with all the gear. Like, you have to be, you have to be like a, almost a pro athlete level of athleticism and cardio. And also be extremely intelligent and able to use your equipment and your compass. And this is like, <laughs> it's amazing because these individuals who become part of this British Special Forces unit are probably so intelligent and so capable. They could have had a very successful career in something else a lot easier. But then again, for, for a lot, for these individuals, this is the calling. This is the, the career they want. And... Again, just like mad respect, this is amazing people do this. Not only will you have to accurately navigate your own course, but you'll only have 22 hours to complete the course. Wow. Failure means your application process is over. And 22 hours? 22 hours to hike 40 miles. For that's over a marathon by a lot. That's almost two marathons, right? In, in a day? Oh my, this is insane have 22 hours to complete the course. Failure means your application process is over and you'll return to your home unit. Just because you pass though, don't expect that you're on to the next official phase oh because gosh. instructors will have been carefully evaluating you the entire time. If they suspect you aren't the right stuff, it won't matter how fast you completed your course or how much weight you can carry. You'll be rejected no. and sent back to your home unit. Even if you pass this part, technically pass it, do everything they ask. That doesn't even mean that you're going to be accepted into the next part. Becoming part of the Special Air Service already sounds like one of the most difficult things a human being can even try to do. Out of 200 candidates, only around 30 to 40 will make it past this phase. And 30 to 40. 200 candidates weeded down to 30 to 40. To move on to the next phase, jungle training. 
Like most of SAS's training, the exact details of what goes on in the jungle phase are classified. What the jungle phase? Of course, it's the jungle in part two, the jungle phase. Is known though is that trainees will learn jungle survival skills, as well as how to conduct patrols deep behind enemy lines wow. and live off the land for weeks at a time. Wow. Trainees will learn how to operate as a four-man unit and live on rations, remaining undetected as they carry out their mission. Now it makes sense why it's such a grueling, specific selection process in the first part, the three-week first phase. Because that next you have to be ready for this, and then of course ultimately to serve in, as a British Special Forces unit, like theoretically in combat zones, like in, in totally hostile environments where you need to be able to survive and not only survive but accomplish difficult tasks and important like duties and reconnaissance for Britain. So this, it, <laughs> it's so crazy and extreme, the training, but it all makes sense for the end goal, I guess. A strong emphasis on physical fitness will also see trainees hit the gym every day. Right. And after the gym, there will be a great deal of time spent out on the range. There, you'll learn how to operate standard bits of SAS gear right. to include battle rifles, recoilless rifles, grenade launchers, and light machine guns. Grenade launchers? Grenade launchers and light machine guns. Dear God. Trainees will also learn how to operate many other weapons in use across the world. An SAS soldier must know how to pick up a weapon in a foreign battlefield and use it effectively if he needs to. You'll also undergo training wow. on setting up ambushes as well as responding to enemy ambushes. You'll be trained in advanced scouting techniques and how to observe your environment for subtle changes that could signal a hidden enemy patrol or a sniper perched in waiting. Detect Oh my god, this is like the part of the training where you just become like a s super soldier. Like some of this stuff, this is fascinating. I understand they have like limited like availability to specifically what this training is, but this is so fascinating. Like some of this stuff, like how that the stuff that they have to prepare them for is mind boggling. Detecting changes in color, shadows, or even small movements can mean the difference between life and death for an yeah. SAS operative deep behind enemy lines. Yeah. As with many other Special Forces training programs, you'll also learn advanced defensive driving techniques, enabling a quick getaway in any hostile situation. They also seem to prepare them for any kind of environment, like a city car environment, or a jungle environment, or desert, or whatever. This is... It's so crazy because I didn't even know about this British Special Forces unit, the SAS. I didn't even know about it. And it's like one of the most intense things I've ever heard of. These are many of the same techniques that police use for stopping speeding drivers. But you'll learn how to avoid those same techniques and not be stopped yourself. Dang. We hope you like blowing things up because you'll also be learning how to handle a variety of explosives. And right. because explosions typically mean wounded, you'll receive extensive medical training that can be quickly deployed out in the field. They literally learn how to do everything. They literally are trained to do anything. Like, but I guess that's what happens when you need to be prepared for anything and can't expect anything. You have to expect everything, so you have to prepare for anything. That should be their slogan right there. <laughs> One of the most important jobs that special forces operators do in war is reconnaissance. And mm. so you'll learn how to establish listening posts and observation posts and okay. covertly observe an enemy. To aid you in your mission, you'll learn how to use a variety of secure communications gear, such as satellite radios, and how to avoid getting pinned down by the enemy due to your electronic emissions. Oh my gosh, this is another reason why I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the people in the British Special Forces have like advanced degrees or higher education or you have to be so intelligent. That's the that's the difficult thing is you don't you have to be so athletically gifted and so work so hard and be so strong and have such good cardio for all the manual physical tasks, but you have to be so intelligent and so tech savvy. To, to know how to use all this equipment and do all this reporting. It's really like these are superhumans here in this special British Special Forces. What the heck? Lastly, you'll undergo extensive hand-to-hand -hand and close quarters combat techniques right. and become an expert in breaching and assaulting enemy structures. To make it to the end of this phase, you'll be amongst the 15 to 20 who didn't get sick from the jungle environment and drop out. Okay, so 40 started with 200 in the endurance phase went to 30 or 40 in the jungle phase. Then, man, that's so crazy that you can get that far. Weeks and weeks of training, 
you can still get eliminated because they're only looking for the best of the best candidates. Now you're down to like 15 at this point, 15 candidates. Or weren't washed out by instructors. Don't start congratulating yourself yet though, <laughs> because the ultimate test is coming up next. Oh my God. Part one of your final test is a three day escape and evasion course. You part one, not, <laughs> of course there's multiple parts to the final test, final phase. Part one of phase three is a three day long escape and evasion. Of course it is. You'll be given a ratty old coat, boots that may be held together with only strings and no food or water. You'll have a short head start and must evade capture for three days by a hunter force equipped with dogs and modern equipment. No for way. these three days, you must live off the land while evading your pursuers. And oh. though officially you're barred from entering any structures, some crafty trainees may sneak their way into a civilian property and maybe even have a local take them in. As This is, I mean, it's literally, hey, let's put these candidates in the closest thing to a real world worst case scenario where they have no equipment, no food, thrown in the middle of nowhere, with people with hunting dogs trying to chase them and find them. That's the test. And do that for three days and survive. This is like, I thought this is what they did in Sparta or whatever thousands of years ago. <laughs> I didn't know this was going on right now. This is insane. I, I have never even heard of this kind of test in like American special forces. And we, of course, picture ourselves of the best of the best of the best but this is absolutely mad this is absolute madness what kind of what kind of people do you get at the end of this not not any soldier i would ever want to encounter this is scary <laughs> as with most special forces tests cheating is simply another creative way of accomplishing the required objective okay. as long as you aren't caught that okay. is the second part of your final test will take place when you're captured or at the end of the three days if you've managed to avoid capture then you'll be expected to return to a designated location at the end of the third day once there you'll be handcuffed have a bag thrown over your head and be taken to a remote location Instructors will then attempt to break you down mentally. You'll be played. Whoa, this is like, I realize this is like a military unit preparing you for the actual worst case scenarios imaginable and that you are the person they're going to call on for these scenarios. Uh, so I, I was going to say this is like pushing it, but this is the kind of stuff. This is really like the top percent of military personnel and training when they're, when the training to decide if you're worthy or what they are looking for is literally survive for three days being chased, then be tied up and have a bag put over your head and psychologically tortured. But that's the training. That's, I didn't even know stuff like this existed. Placed in stress positions and forced to hold them for hours at a time. You may be locked in a cage the size of a dog kennel while instructors bash the roof of it with chains. Instructors will strip you nude in front of female instructors who will mock the size of your manhood. It <laughs> what? Wait, what? I'm not, I'm not even trying to laugh here, but what are we talking about right now? It's all a mental game, meant to soften you up for the pending interrogation sessions. After enough humiliation and mental torture, you'll be thrown into a room with an interrogator, and your job will be to only reveal the big four to him or her. Your name... So, I mean, at this point, my god. That's the most extreme thing I've ever heard in regards to training, military training. This is essentially supposed to be the closest thing to a real-life torture, capture scenario you could ever experience. And I mean, my, my initial reaction is like, what the heck, this is weird. But when this kind of thing becomes like, uh, it is a professional job. Like, it's just a strange job. The job is that you need to be ready it, in the event that you're captured and tortured and interrogated, because that's part of your job. That could happen in this line of work. So with that being said, I guess it, as long as they take the proper precautions, I'm sure they do with like medical personnel waiting in case something goes wrong. But there's no like, there's no soft kind of nuanced way to do something like this. It's just the stripping naked and making fun of the nakedness part was like, wow, that made it maybe too real. Name, rank, serial number, and date of birth. 
giving the interrogator any information other than that will lead to your immediate expulsion from SAS training. Right. That's it, the end of the line for you. If you make it through this final phase, then you can feel proud of accomplishing what very few people have ever done. You'll receive- I mean, 15 went into this part three. How many people survive something like that without saying, screw this, I don't need to be part of this, I don't need to be doing this, when they're stuffing you in a cage and bashing the top with chains and stripping you naked. You, not a lot of people can handle that, but I get it, that's the point. The point is, not a lot of humans can handle that. So they, they must... <laughs> the people that end up at the end of this training and passing are incredible, maybe a little crazy, but that's what you want. May or maybe not crazy, just the most mentally strong individuals you can imagine. Maybe, to me, it would just make me crazy, but for these individuals, it's just like, they have found peak human mental toughness here. Wow. Receive the Beige Beret with the winged dagger insignia and officially become a member of the British Special Air Service. Wow. However, maybe yeah. celebrate modestly because you'll be on probation until you finish your continuation training and sadly, many soldiers are returned to their home unit during this phase. If that happens to you, you'll at least have worn the beret for a short time and that's an accomplishment in and of itself. It okay, so after you pass the whole thing, you're sent back to your original unit, maybe to wait on standby or continue training. I mean, after that, it, doesn't all the training, like running on the obstacle course, feel kind of easy <laughs> after surviving three weeks, then in the jungle, then three more days, <laughs> three more days of being <laughs> uh, manhunted, then put in a cage and interrogated? Isn't the rest kind of easy after that? I don't know. If you make it through training though, you'll join the 22nd Special Air Service Regiment, which consists of four active squadrons, A, B, D, and G. Okay. Each squadron is made up of around 60 men, meaning wow. there's roughly 240 active duty SAS soldiers at a time in the British- 240 active SAS at any time. 240 of the most in incredible um, individuals that I do not want to cross ever in my life military with two reserve regiments the 21st and 23rd SAS right. this is in sharp contrast to the approximately 2,000 Navy SEALs the US military has I was wondering about this how the Navy SEALs compare to the SAS because that's what I think of when I think of this special forces unit in Britain is the most intense mad special force unit in the United States which is considered the Navy SEALs by most people 2,000 SEALs and only 240 SAS. I wonder if it's just straight up more difficult to be an SAS or if they're more selective or maybe it's because the British population is a lot smaller than the American population. I don't know. That's due to the smaller size of the British military. Okay. Amongst each SAS squadron are four troops, and each troop specializes in a different area of expertise. The air troop is specialized in parachute insertions, including static line insertions and halo wow. jumps deep behind enemy lines. The boat troop is specialized in amphibious operations, such as inserting into hostile beaches via submarines, a favorite tactic of U.S. SEALs. Wow. Interestingly, SAS and America... So even within the SAS of these super specialized, super capable, super people, <laughs> military supermen, uh, there's even more specialization of four different types of SAS specialties, okay. American SEALs work so closely together that often SAS soldiers will deploy from an American submarine specially outfitted to deliver special forces under the cover of the waves. Oh, so the US Navy SEALs and the SAS actually work together on st a lot of stuff. That's cool, very cool. They seem extraordinarily similar in their, their training and their level of intensity and purpose in the military. Mobility troop soldiers specialize in handling any number of vehicles. You can think of them as the getaway drivers of the SAS. Okay. Mountain troops are trained in Arctic warfare and navigating oh. and surviving in dangerous mountainous terrain. SAS mountain troops work closely with American and French special forces in the mountain regions of Afghanistan, hunting down Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters in deep mountain complexes. Wow, so there, there's just an SAS for any situation, basically. The close-knit relationship between SAS and American Special Forces means that both nations share many of the same tactics and training techniques, oh. and an SAS soldier is always welcome aboard any American aircraft or boat. It cool, cool. I was wondering about this, because this whole thing, I was, I was thinking like, 
This, the only thing I can think of that even compares to this, the SAS and this crazy training, this insane selection process is the difficulty associated with becoming an American Navy SEAL, which is kind of like legendary and spe very like special, like in America when we talk about the military. It's like, oh, Navy SEALs, ooh. That's what the SAS is in Britain. That, make, that makes sense to me. If you had joined the SAS in the early 2000s, you may have been a part of the legendary Task Force 88, easily the deadliest fighting force ever assembled on planet Earth. Oh, oh, Immediately after Saddam Hussein's government was ousted from power, Task Force 88 was formed to hunt down the former dictator and his supporters. Wow. And over the years, their job evolved to becoming the premier hunter-killers of NATO's war against terrorist leaders in Iraq and Afghanistan. Oh my Most God. of their deeds are shrouded in extreme secrecy, though it's known that... If you're the like scary super squad of the SAS which is a giant <laughs> like <laughs> special forces unit of scary people scary capable genius athlete <laughs> like super capable military personnel if you're within this squad of the scary ones then <laughs> god help us <laughs> TF-88 or, or God help whoever they are hunting down rather luckily they're on our side and uh, and I do mean our side as and also the American side as well thank goodness thank goodness that we are friendly <laughs> it was responsible for killing one of the key members of the insurgency Al Zarqawi at its height Task Force 88 was made up of Task Force Black an SAS Sabre Squadron supported by specialist boat service operators. Task Force Blue was made up of the legendary SEAL Team 6. Right. Task Force Green was made up of operatives from America's Delta Force. And Task Force Orange was made up of the single most secretive special forces operators in the world, wow. America's Intelligence Support Activity. A special forces unit whose job is to find actionable intelligence for other special forces units and which the Pentagon denies any official knowledge of. Ta I, I didn't actually know that the British Special Forces and the American Special Forces worked together so closely. That's actually, it's really cool that that's a part of this video. I didn't know that. Task Force 88 was an example of the close-knit relationship between the Special Air Service and its American counterparts. And that relationship continues to this day in unacknowledged conflicts all around the world. Nice. If you think you've got what it takes to make it through SAS selection after watching our video, maybe you too will no. be working side by side no. with the world's best hunting down bad guys no. in jungles, deserts, and mountains all over the globe. Now that you've watched this- No, 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 no. Not for me, but I, such mad respect for the individuals who attempt to become this, and for those who succeed, we desperately need those people. They are one in a million, or one in uh, like 20, 50 million. They are very special individuals who have the mental and physical capability and also the drive to become like this line of work, this part of serving the British military and the individuals here that do the same for our American special forces. This is just so, it's so cool and it's nice to be reminded of this kind of thing, how incredibly difficult this is. Um, this was by the Infographics Show. I really enjoyed it. That was like listening to one of the craziest, wildest, most fascinating stories I've ever heard. Just listening to the British Special Forces training regiment and the three phases and everything they go through that they make it this training as realistic as possible to weed out the best of the best of the best and then squeeze from that, wring out from that sponge even better people to serve as these tippity top people that you want in these positions in your military it's it's a part of a sort of this part of the world part of our nation and our military that i don't even think about that much like the military in general since i'm not in it or and especially the special forces which serve such an important purpose for both of our nations that you don't you don't even really think about it and then, so I, I really enjoyed watching this video. I think that's what I'm trying to say. And kind of being reminded what goes into becoming one of these people and that they're serving all the time in this incredible way. So I, I actually really, really enjoyed this a lot. And I had no idea about the British Special Forces before this video. Mad respect. This was eye-opening. Incredible. 
a little scary too, but enjoyable. So anyway, if you enjoyed this video as well, feel free to give it a like or leave a comment, perhaps with what you think about the British Special Forces, the Special Air Service. And if you're interested in more videos like this, me reacting to Britain and British culture, feel free to subscribe for more. And until then, thanks for watching and see you next time.